Welcome everyone to another segment of the New Jersey Cannabis Association Lunch and Learn Program. I'm Ed DeVoe, president of the New Jersey Cannabis Association, and I'm coming to you live, or if you were watching us later, I'm coming to you from Pizza and Pasta on Williams, William Street in Piscataway. Look, if you're looking for comfort food, Jersey comfort food, this is the place to come. So Pizza and Pasta, William Street in Piscataway, want to thank everyone for letting me do the program from here today. Uh, so as we get started, uh, once again, uh, please feel free to use the chat feature uh, to network with one another. As you use the chat feature, uh, please be sure to mark everyone, uh, because sometimes if you just have panelists, only my special guests and I can see uh, your names and your information. So please check everyone uh, so that everyone can get your information. So as I, uh, as I tried to share uh, earlier on LinkedIn, uh, we in fact do have uh, some information that we uh, want to share with you uh, in terms of updates from the CRC. Uh, before I get to that, uh, not only do I want to thank Pizza and Pasta in Piscataway, I want to thank our sponsors, Argus 365, a security firm, Burton Trent Public Affairs, Curaleaf, Ease, Financial Resources Federal Credit Union, Garden State Greenhouse, the law firm of Inglesino Webster with Scala and Taylor, Puffin Entrepreneurs and Investors, the Sheet Metal Workers, Local 19, Siska Hennessy Group, a construction firm, the UFCW in Hugh Giordano, and Weeds Direct. Uh, once again, I want to thank everyone for joining us. As you know, we uh, try to bring you the best and brightest of, of information uh, so that you can be great business people in this emerging industry. Uh, as we get started today, uh, I do want to share with you, uh, if you haven't been to the CRC website, and uh, if you are a current uh, applicant, I do want to share with you this important information from the CRC. So this week, the CRC is in fact moving through a milestone of, of the licensing process. Uh, the CRC has completed certain stages of uh, the application review. And so what's happening this week or what's happening in the next few days, if you are a current applicant, you may in fact receive uh, what the CRC is terming as a rejection notice. Now, it may be sent to you as a rejection notice. However, it is not a complete rejection. It is a notice to let you know that your application has deficiencies. You may enter the site, you may enter the portal, you may revise your application and resubmit. You are not kicked out of the process. This is not an RFA or request for applications with a start date and an end date. This is a rolling application process. If you do in fact receive a rejection notice, it is simply a notice to let you know that your application has deficiencies. You are to go back into the portal, repair those deficiencies and resubmit. You will not lose your place in line. You will not lose your place in line. Once you resubmit, you go back to the place in which your application was received. So what I will do is put in the chat feature the, the email address uh, that gives, or not, I'm sorry, the link. I will provide for you the link if, that will provide instructions if you in fact receive a rejection notice. So applicants can check their updates and application status with the CRC licensing program. If no update has been posted, your application is still under review. Okay, so if you haven't received any notice at all, that means your application is still under review and they will get to it as soon as they can. So again, just wanna encourage everyone that's in the application portal, uh, the cultivators, the processors, uh, the lab testing facilities, that your applications are in fact under review. You may receive a rejection notice. That rejection notice simply is letting you know that your application has deficiencies. So again, I'll put in the, the chat feature, the link to check uh, for further information, but I did wanna share that. And lastly, uh, because we are at this critical stage 
of the application process. Uh, and before we get to our special guest, uh, Ryan Brent from Witham, I do want to share with you next Friday's Lunch and Learn. Uh, our regularly scheduled guest, uh, Cannabis IT, has agreed graciously to move. And we will have next Friday three staff members of the CRC prior to the application portal opening. So that's March 11th, next Friday. They will be here on Lunch and Learn to help you with your retail application and the e retail application process. So it'll be a special segment. We're looking forward to next Friday with staff members of the CRC. So thank you all once again for joining us. Now look, we at the New Jersey Cannabis Business Association, the state's first and largest trade association for the cannabis industry. Uh, we were here and are here to help the state develop a responsible, sustainable, diverse and profitable cannabis industry. And so uh, we appreciate your support. Do check out our website. That'll be in the chat feature as well. And so without further ado, I want to thank our special guest, Ryan Brent of Witham. Uh, we're going to talk today uh, about some very special uh, information that you need to know. Uh, I had a couple of questions that I'll share with Ryan uh, after he gives his uh, preamble and starts his presentation that will hopefully help uh, those that are in the application process and certainly those uh, that will be filing as uh, successful applicants. So with that, Ryan Brent of Witham, thank you so much for being with us. All right, thanks, Ed. Um, and thank you for having me this afternoon. Uh, save me a slice while you're at it, extra cheese. Thanks, man. Uh, yeah, and I wanna, while I had the, the platform, I wanna thank you, the NJCBA, for being just another great association here in New Jersey. Uh, I appreciate that you guys are on the forefront of this emerging market. Um, I'm constantly going through all the content that you put out. I'm looking forward to the events that you have planned in the future, both virtual and in person. So with that said, uh, my name, as Ed mentioned, is Ryan Brandt. I am a CPA. I am a senior tax manager at Witham Smith & Brown, and I've been with the firm for about five years now. I've been in practice for about 15. So my background is tax compliance for flow through entities and corporations. I also deal with a lot of high net worth individuals. So basically all things tax related are in my wheelhouse. So I got involved in this industry, you know, after leading the tax compliance work for two of the original six New Jersey medicinal facilities. This, this actually allowed me to get experience with fully vertical operations. And when I say fully vertical, I mean seed to sale, right? Cultivation, extraction, manufacturing, and retail, the full boat. So my focus and specialty is Internal Revenue Code Section 280E, which is really the main issue for our plant touching companies. My job as a practitioner is to do whatever it takes to make sure my clients are aware of the tax burden of this reg and make sure they're able to navigate the choppy waters of this code section, because even though it's a small tax code, there are many different strategies and ways to interpret it. I like to, for instance, explore seed to sale inventory optimization, accelerating depreciation deductions, and also strategic business structuring. Uh, these are some of the more important areas that I like to explore, especially if you're in the startup phase, which I know a lot of you on this webinar are in the startup phase, you're going through the application process, you're either already applied for cultivation or you're gonna be submitting your March 15th retail license. So with that said, since I've been with the firm, I've been our tax specialist for every cannabis, CBD and hemp company that we service. We do everything from financial statement audits to tax compliance and various other advisory services. I'm actually fortunate enough to work with a, a very robust team of cannabis specialists here at the firm. Even though I have a tax background, we also have teams dedicated to cost segregation studies, transfer pricing studies, R&D tax credits, and just general bookkeeping and accounting services. We're a full service firm and we continue to expand the team just as our client base becomes larger, especially here in New Jersey. And Ed, it's gonna become larger and we're seeing it firsthand. We've been working with a ton of these retail and cultivation applicants over the past year or so, 
they're anxious to hit the market. They're ready to go. I'm telling you, this 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 industry is going to explode. I believe our governor actually mentioned that we could see recreational sales go live in the next week or so. So stay tuned for that, Ed. Uh, so I think we have a couple questions in the chat box. Do you want to get to um, some of these here? So what's the big deal with Section 280E? What kind of tax impact will it have on the cannabis business owners? Okay, so Section 280E, right? This, this webinar is going to revolve around the, that code section. And that's something you got to really know about and understand. And just at least take something away from this webinar. It's going to be that Section 280E is definitely a burden to some of these businesses that are going to be starting up here in Jersey. Uh, so let's talk about some of the things we've been seeing here at Wyvern. Um, now, there are a ton of things that you should be aware of just tapping into this market. Obviously, you're worried about hiring employees. You're going to be worried about maintaining your supply of inventory if you're a dispensary. You have the banking issues. You have the insurance issues. The list goes on and on, as you guys know. But from a tax perspective, I want to briefly discuss Section 280E, since it's going to affect everybody that's involved in this entire cycle, no matter which way you slice it. No pun intended, Ed, with the, with the pizza slices. Uh, this is something that's going to sting cultivators, and it's going to go right down the chain to retailers. So real quick, it's a short provision. IRC Section 280E is part of the Internal Revenue Code that says if you are dealing with a drug that is a Schedule One or Schedule II list of substances, according to this, the Controlled Substance Act, you're considered trafficking, okay? And if you're considered trafficking, you're not allowed to take ordinary business expenses on your tax return. However, there is a silver lining. You are able to deduct costs of goods sold, okay? But you can't deduct anything underneath that, okay? All of the overhead, the selling general administrative expenses, that stuff is out the door, okay? So bottom line, this is going to take a big chunk off your profits. And if you haven't thought about taxes and you're looking to get in this industry, just I'm, I'm letting you know now you need to be aware of this stuff. And if you don't know, we could always help. OK, that one hour, comp that one hour conference call will give you an overview. We'll take a look at the business. We'll let you know where your pain points are going to be. So real quick, how did this all come about? And this is a throwback. OK, it's a throwback to the Reagan administration. Section 280E actually originated from a 1981 court case where a convicted cocaine trafficker, he asserted his right under federal law to take ordinary business expenses. This was the Edmondson versus Commissioner case, if you're not aware of it. This dude, Ed Edmondson, he was actually dealing drugs and he was being tax compliant, no figure, right? He was wheeling and dealing and he was actually filing accurate tax returns. However, the IRS came in, they audited him, and they took the position that he cannot take any deductions. He's a drug dealer. He shouldn't be taking deductions. We should not allow this. However, this Edmondson guy, he brought the issue to court and prevailed, okay? He was able to deduct all his ordinary necessary business expenses. So it's safe to say the IRS, Congress, they were not pleased with the outcome. So the next year, in 1982, Congress created 280E to prevent other drug dealers from following suit. Almost 40 years later, cannabis companies are still dealing with this tax burden. They're still not able to take selling general administrative tax deductions, and it's a real, it's a real problem, Ed. So, I mean, that that's really the gist of 280E. Um, and if you want to, if you want to get into it, um, I have a question here: whether, uh, let's see. You mentioned that every cannabis business, whether you are involved in cultivation or retail, is subject to 280E. That's correct. Is there one particular business in the industry vertical that gets hit harder than others? I guess like tax-wise. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Yes. The answer is yes. If you operate a marijuana dispensary, for all you applicants out there, March 15th deadline, if you're operating a marijuana dispensary, Section 280E is going to be a problem. Okay. You could only deduct the price of the product, the packaging of that product, and the delivery fee, period, okay? That's not a lot of stuff, right? That, that's a big expense, the purchase price of the product, but, you, but think about all the other expenses that you're gonna be running into when running a dispensary. You have salaries and wages. You're gonna have bud tenders, right? You're gonna have 10, 10 full-time bud tenders at a dispensary. 
That's a lot of wages, okay? Off the table, not a deduction. Rent, right? You're renting the facility. You're paying for utilities, marketing, insurance, professional fees, even the expense of security that protects your business. These guys are all off the table, not allowed to take it as a deduction, okay? And that's a problem. That, that could lead to a 60% effective tax rate, okay? Uh, I actually have an example. If we want to uh, pull up that example, I think April is uh, behind the scenes and she could pull up an example real quick. And I'll run through it and just show you. I'll, I'll put this into perspective. I'll give you guys a visual. I like to reference this example here uh, because it really shows the impact that 288 could have on your company. So real quick, on the left, we have Bob's Bakery. Legal business, doing business in New Jersey. He sells baked goods, just your regular old bakery. On the right, we have that illegal business, Mary Jane's Edibles, oh no. She sells baked goods that contain THC, the psychoactive drug that's in, uh, that, that, that gets you high, okay? That's in her brownies. Bob doesn't have THC in his brownies. As you can see, they had the same financials across the board, okay? Cash flow is the same, nothing is different. They each have $1.5 million of revenue. They each have $750,000 cost, cost of goods sold. Um, they both have gross income of 750 with gross profit margin of 50%, right? 50% gross margin. And that's typical of dispensaries, right? This might not be a dispensary. I said, you know, it's a bakery, but we'll, we'll think of it as a dispensary. 50% gross margin. That's a big, that's a pretty good, you know, bang for your buck. They both have 490,000 operating expense deductions. I call these below the line deductions. The only difference between these two entities is that Mary Jane's edibles uses cannabis in their baked goods. So they're, con they're considered under section 280E, they're considered trafficking in illegal substance and therefore subject to that tax code. This means that all the below the line deductions, you see the advertising, the rent, the payroll, it adds up to $490,000. They're disallowed. They, Mary Jane cannot take these as a, a deduction. Uh, you can see I put a big red X through that figure. And that's what the IRS is going to do. They're going to put a big red X through that, those financial statements to say, you, you can't take them as deductions, 280E. As you can see, Bob's taxable income, $260,000. Mary Jane's taxable income, $750,000. Same as her gross profit. So you have Bob who's paying tax on 260. You have Mary Jane who's paying tax on 750. Same company, right? Again, similar companies, uh, similar income and expenses, but Mary Jane's gonna pay about $100,000 more in tax uh, just because her product contains THC. Um, and real quick, her tax rate on the overall, so I, I, I look at the effective tax rate and that's based off the net income. Uh, the net income for both of these companies is similar. She pays an effective tax rate of 61% compared to Bob at the corporate tax rate of 21%. It's amazing how fast that effective tax rate can go up once you disallow certain deductions. Okay, and this isn't rocket science. If you're plant touching company, you just need to realize you're getting taxed on that gross profit and not your actual taxable income. So this is just a shows the reality of 280. Okay. Ryan, thank you. This this is a great slide uh, for people to uh, try to retain. Uh, there were some great questions I saw in the chat. So uh, let, let's digress for a moment. Uh, because this is application time and because uh, there were uh, maybe some applicants that are still waiting to do their taxes, the application process are costs associated with the application process deductible? The attorney fees, the the application writer, uh, mortgage uh, uh, inquiries, things like that, are application costs tax deductible? Yeah, so that's a good question, Ed. And, um, you know, it's a gray area. So basically, on a regular business, you know, there's about... You, those fees could go up to about $200,000, $200,000, legal fees, application writing fees, uh, accounting fees, all that good stuff is going to cost you 250, 250K. Is that deductible? Well, on a regular business, you're supposed to capitalize it and then amortize it over 15 years, the life of the amortizable property. 
Um, for Section 280E purposes, it depends on whether you're a cultivator. It depends on you know the 471A uh, classification of those expenses. Like, what are those expenses actually related to? If it's sort, if you could kind of pull it into the product and say, okay, it's related to the cost of the product, then maybe you get away with the deducting it. But short answer, probably not. Um, we could always dive deeper into what those expenses are and itemize them and do an analysis and say, listen, some of these costs could be considered deductible. But again, it's not going to be deductible in the first year. You're going to amortize them over 15 years. This first year of startup cost, you're you're, you're capitalizing it to the, the balance sheet. And then every year you're going to take a little bit of amortization. And you got to kind of figure out what that amortization expense is going to be that goes into cost of goods sold. Yeah. But I'm Hey, right, up, right off the bat, probably the majority of that is not going to be deductible under Section 280. Great. Thank you. Uh, another area, because we as the association, uh, and I've coined us the, the Cannabis Chamber of Commerce, uh, we represent others uh, other than plant touching uh, enterprises. What if you are one of the ancillary businesses doing business with cannabis businesses? Uh, I'm a janitorial service and I do work for a plant touching enterprise. Are my expenses tax deductible? Yeah, so I'm an ancillary business, right? I support and help out these cannabis companies. I'm an accountant, I work for cannabis companies. Um, as long as you're not a plant touching company and you're not trafficking in cannabis, uh, and you're just supporting the operations or providing a service to help the business, you don't fall under Section 280D. You know, I could I could think of a couple ancillary businesses that might fall into this category. Let's say, let's say you're a landlord renting to a dispensary. Then no, you're not subject to 280E. You're not trafficking in controlled substance. You're just you're just renting to a legal business in New Jersey. Myself as an accountant, like I said, I provide services to a dispensary. I'm not subject to 280E. Um, think about the companies that just sell grow lighting and equipment specifically to marijuana cultivators just because they're in the base you know the, the main drive of their revenue is to cannabis companies does not mean that they're actually trafficking in that substance so yeah no ancillary businesses are not going to be subject to 280 great thank you ryan uh and i think that answered a couple of questions as i saw other ancillary businesses posting that question and if I could summarize your answer, if you are not plant touching, meaning cultivating, processing, and we'll get to, I saw a transportation or delivery question uh, there, but, but essentially, if you are a janitorial service, pest control, uh, security, you're not considered a, and I hate to use the term trafficker, Right. So even delivery services, right? If you, if you're, if you're delivery, if you're just a delivery service, you know, you, you could be going back and forth to the bank. You could be delivering from the cultivator to the, to the retailer. You know, you're just a delivery service. You're, you're not, you're, you're not a, uh, you're not in the business to traffic cannabis per se. You're just in a delivery business. So you got to really kind of separate those two. Thank you. I, I'm sure that helped a lot of folks. And uh, before we go back to the uh, to the chat, uh, are there any uh, historical cases that uh, that you could reference that that kind of supports the the justification that to wisely get into the business and uh, and to do things wisely uh, when you go in? Yeah. So there's, I mean, a ton of court cases out there, uh, mostly. They're not favoring the cannabis touching companies. Uh, every time there's a new court case, it just it just makes my job more difficult, right? We had one just come out this last week, the Lord case. Um, we're still trying to work through the uh, intricacies of that one. Um, some some other more notable cases, obviously the Harborside case. Uh, this was a case that was arguing whether Harborside was a manufacturer, or cultivator, or a reseller. Uh, the IRS said they're a reseller, therefore subject subject to the Dash Three. B regulations, when Harborside actually said they're a producer and they're subject, subject to the Dash 3C regulations. This is a different topic related to the 471 regs. I don't want to get into that right now, but 
Harborside loss. It's a, it's a big loss for the cannabis community. Um, also the Champ versus Commissioner case. You know, Champ won this case, right? They won, but it wasn't a good look for the cannabis industry because now the IRS always looks at the Champ case and says, they were a separate business, even though, you know, they had the little marijuana uh, facility in the corner and the rest of their business was caregiving services. The IRS agreed that they're separate businesses. But now when we try to make that argument, the IRS goes back to the Champ case and says, well, you're not a little tiny marijuana produce uh, selling company. You're a big marijuana selling company and you're trying to kind of separate that small non plant touching business out. And now, you know, that's it, even though it was a win for Champ, I think it was a loss for the cannabis community. Um, other cases that are notable, Oliver's Commissioner, another another case, um, and you know San Jose Wellness First Commissioner. These are all all famous cases that got just you know thrown out in court. They they the, the courts always agree with the IRS. Uh, it just it's just dismal when it goes to the, when it goes to the uh, the court of law, and, and it's never really works out for the cannabis community. I see, I see, I see a question here that says, um, so what about cultivators? Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. I imagine they're affected as much by 280E, like the dispenser example you just ran through. Oh, they're not as affected by 280E. Yeah. So a cultivator, you still fall within the boundaries of section 280E, right? But if you're a cultivator, you're in a better position than the dispensers. Okay. Marijuana cultivators typically... They include and they, they support the costs through costs of goods sold. Uh, this means the, cultiva the, the cultivation related costs are deductible. Things that go into building the product, making the product, growing that product, they're most likely going to fall in that deductibility zone because those expenses are going to fall in their costs of goods sold. So think about it. Labor, labor for the farmers. You have farmers tending to the crop. That goes into the cost of goods sold. You have water, you have soil. You have testing. These are all things that are costs that go into costs of it's sold. Deductible, perfect. The warehouse, right? You build out a big warehouse or greenhouse. We could depreciate that through costs of it's sold. Those are all things that you need in order to grow that plant. You know, grow equipment, grow lights, fans, refrigeration, filter, filter, all these great big expenses are deductible under section 280E for cultivators. Um, so yes, to answer your question, Cultivators are in a better position than dispensaries, but they're also subject to 280E. They do have overhead expenses, but they just have more costs of goods sold, okay? Their gross margins are, you know, the, the gross margins are a lot less, let's put it that way, than, than in a um, uh, dispensary. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, so, what are margins are did I say less? I meant most margins are a lot, <laughs> they're more inflated. Right. <laughs> so in your in a very broad sense, uh, what are some of the things to look out for uh, that could benefit you uh, when you're preparing uh, as a as a plant touching entity? What what are the things that you look for to help you along the way? If you're a plant touching entity, well, you're going to need first, obviously, as we know with the application process, you're going to need to get approval from the from the town to, to set up shop, okay? And then you're going to have to figure out how much shelf space you need. And you're also going to have to figure out how much utilities, how much equipment, all these things that go into growing the plant. It's not like you just got to pay for seeds and dirt, okay? There's, there's filtration systems involved. You need to build out the greenhouse. You need to figure out the HVAC situations. You need to figure out the the amount of uh, harvest you're going to have in a year in order to support your pro formas. Uh, these are all things that come with planning. Uh, you're going to need to know somebody in the business that knows how to grow. Um, you're going to need to have harvesters. You're going to need to have farmers. You're going to need to have uh, 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 people to trim that product, process it. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it. And, you know, the costs could get, you know, astronomically high if you don't really scale it the way you should be. So, um, and you also want to, you know, you also want to have the facility itself, right? If you're just buying a warehouse, you got to hook that thing up with fans. You got to hook that thing up with lights. You got to make sure that the, the air quality is good. The temperature stays consistent. 
You want to make sure you have backup generators in case the power goes out. You know, one day without lights, it could, it could ruin your whole crop. But one day when the when the when the weather is hot outside and you lose the HVAC, you know, those those plants could you know take a take a turn for the worse. So it really helps to have somebody who knows how to grow and uh, also professionals like myself to know how to keep that business operational and sustainable and profitable. Right. So let me let me rephrase the question. Uh, what what are what is the best way to alleviate the burdens of 280e? Well, you're going to have to have a good chart of accounts. Number one, you need to make sure you classify all your costs of goods sold, and you're consistent with that. Okay, if you have payroll, okay, you need to put all your farmers, all those people who are farmers, all those people who are trimmers, you need to make sure that they're above the line and they're going into costs of goods sold. You need to make sure you're allocating that depreciation based on the grow, the grow area. So if you have a uh, thousand square feet of grow space and 200 feet of that uh, space, that facility is, you know, office expense, stuff that doesn't really go into make growing that plant. You need to do, you know, 20% is going to be below the line for depreciation. 80% we could flush it through cost of goods sold and take that deduction. You know, things like this, it all comes down to us coming in there, looking at the facility, looking at who your employees are, what they do. A lot of this stuff is all about documentation. If you are putting costs into cost of goods sold, you need to document why you're doing it. You need to document the square footage. You need to document what the, uh, the, the, uh, the roles are of each of your employees. Uh, these are all big things that will, you know, go into your, 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 your case, if you're ever trying to make a case for an audit, you know, you have the support. Great, Ryan. So as we get ready to wrap up, uh, I'll give you a minute to put your contact information uh, in the chat. And uh, I'm sure uh, you, you won't say no to a new client. I saw that question early on. Uh, are you guys taking new clients? So I'll let you handle that on your own. But uh, Ryan sure. Brent, I want to I want to thank you so much uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule and uh, sharing with the New Jersey Cannabis Business Association. I want to thank all of our attendees. I want to thank Pizza and Pasta in Piscataway on William Street in Piscataway. Thank you guys so much for letting me be here. Your food is great, and uh, I'll be partaking in some shortly. I want to thank our sponsors. Argus 365, a security firm, Burton Trent Public Affairs, Curaleaf, Ease, Financial Resources Federal Credit Union, Garden State Greenhouse, the law firm of Inglesino, Webster, Wixcala, and Taylor, Huffin Entrepreneurs and Investors, the Sheet Metal Workers, Local 19, Siska Hennessy Group, a construction firm, the UFCW and Hugh Giordano, and Weeds Direct. Thank you all so much. Please do visit the CRC website, uh, check it out. And uh, again, if you are a receiving a rejection notice, it is more of a notice for you to repair and fix deficiencies in your application. Go back and reapply. You are not completely done. This is an, a rolling application process. It is not a traditional RFA with uh, closure for you if uh, your application is returned to you. Uh, don't forget, next Friday, uh, we have been uh, blessed to have staff members of the CRC join us pre-application time. So next Friday, March 11th, uh, thanks to the CRC and its leadership uh, to see the value that we bring to the industry and, uh, and sharing their, their people with us, thanks to with them and sharing Ryan Brandt with us. Thank you so much for your expertise in the financial sector. And uh, to all of you, once again, thank you so much for joining us.